Hi, this is live from the Hotel Edison, Times Square Chronicles presents. I'm Susanna Bowling. I'm the owner and the publisher of the Times Square Chronicles. My guest today started playing violin at three, was giving concerts at five, and did her first concerto at the Royal Albert Hall in London at 14. She has played with Bobby McFerrin. She has played in 52 countries around the, the world. She recently played at the foot of the pyramids and teaches children and gives of herself. She's about to do a trip to the Dominican Republic. She's also got a St. Patrick's Day concert coming up. Today, with the revival of Tommy coming back to Broadway, she's going to play the mirror song from Tommy. We're talking Daisy Joplin. That was the incredible and remarkable Daisy Joplin, who is both my guest and my friend. Daisy, I know this, but can you please tell our audience, where does playing come from within you? 
That's such an interesting question because I actually feel like it comes from letting go and letting the place of nowhere be where we are. We are nowhere. You know, you let go of the feeling of everything. You don't even know you're there. And you just let the music flow through. That's how I feel I do it, you know. Does music speak to you? Yeah, so it doesn't feel like it's something speaking to me. It feels like I am one with it. Oh, wow. And I'm letting myself be it and it's flooding through me and I'm just allowing you know it's like the life energy music maybe is like a type of life energy oh Don't I they say that oh the, no the I think so of yeah the universe are everything is made of energy and everything is on some level made of vibrations I think so um, when I was healing being, you know? when I was healing and I would put hands on people yeah I I heard music did you always uh-huh wow yeah. So beautiful. Um, you're doing the Tommy. You're doing the Who. One of your shows is the Who. Absolutely. Um, what made you choose the Who? Because right now it's very, very, very big. Yeah. It's a funny story because I'm British. But my parents felt that classical music is the best music to be around a child's brain as it is developing. So we were only allowed to listen to classical music. Which, and I lived in the middle of nowhere at a time where there were no computers or cell phones or internet and we didn't have a television. So I was very, very sheltered and I did not know anything about any pop or rock bands at all. At all. I mean, I remember my mum saying, oh, there's a band called Led Zeppelin and they are the devil. You mustn't listen to them. <laughs> That's all I remember. I didn't, I didn't know, I had never heard of The Who. Wow, how did you learn of The Who? So when I came to the US, uh, everybody said, you've got to play this song called Baba O'Reilly by The Who, which has a violin solo, because especially I live north of New York City now, and The Who of people of our age is just one of the most famous bands to this day. People love The Who. And I was like, I better check out this artist. And of course I fell completely completely in love with Pete Townsend's lyrics and music but like it was so deeply I, I felt like I totally resonate with it and I'm you know so do we all I mean it's like he just speaks on that human level genius metaphorical ways of talking about our human experience and I, I fell in love with it so much that I decided to do a whole album of The Who. And it was funny because I told my parents, because they hadn't heard of The Who, so I'm like, Mom, I'm doing it of this rock band. So my aunt, who, taught, who kind of inspired me to play the violin, who, she's my lifelong mentor, she went online or whatever, you know, Who The Who, she found out that in the middle of their concerts they used to trash their instruments. And she called me in a panic saying, you know, <laughs> you're like doing The Who, but I hope you're not going to trash your violin in the middle of the concert because this violin's like... 246 years old oh wow yeah it's uh can i pet it yeah made in italy you know it's a great italian violin anyway not the kind of thing you want to trash in the middle of the concert it'll be <laughs> that'll be a very expensive concert <laughs> what composers what songs what made you go to music and to violin Apparently, when I was three, I was very inspired by my aunt, who was a professional violinist and mainly an incredible teacher. And she and I have been very, very, very close to this day, very close. So obviously we maybe came into this life, you know, with this close affinity. And apparently I said to my mom, I want to play the violin like Aunt Louise. I want to be like Aunt Louise. I want to play the violin like her. So this was like, I was very insistent and uh, started playing. but. Definitely in my life now, music is my moment to relax, mm. you know, my moment to feel, my moment to be, and it's like my therapy, you know. Oh, no, music is definitely my therapy. Yeah. Like some people go to therapists, I write songs. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Writing songs is such an, I can't, I'm so grateful that I have that. Absolutely. You know, because I really feel better after I've written a song. It's like, wow. Was there one composer or one piece of music, though, that you just craved as a kid? Yes. What? So when I say I did, it's interesting. I say I didn't know who the Who were, which is true, and never heard of the Who. And even in the moment, 
when, I mean, I was 11 years old going to school and I was in like the first couple of months of what they called a secondary school. So I'm like 11 years old, it goes up to 18 years old. So like I'm pretty, I mean, I was leading the orchestra, but I'm pretty young, you know. And I didn't know anything because I had no TV and I never knew that all the kids were like abuzz this day saying, have you heard the news? And of course I said, no, <laughs> I never know what's going on, you know, what's the news? And they said, well, John Lennon has been shot. And honestly, oh. I did not know who John Lennon was. So like, oh, that's I, so I sad. really didn't know. But maybe it was because I was 11. By the time I was maybe 14, I found out about Queen. Oh, love Queen. And I was completely in love with Freddie Mercury and you know his most famous songs really all of them but um bohemian rhapsody the, bohemian rhapsody i knew every single lyric of that song which i didn't know of any other songs i didn't sing at all i didn't i played instrumental music all the time so that song though i would sing i mean every night before i went to sleep i'd sing that song i'd like secretly listen to it and sing it to myself you know so, see yeah. i was into prokofiev and copeland oh so was i i mean because that's yeah but then i learned Oh, pop, well, okay. Oh, what are you going to play? Well, I don't know. There's, there's um, just a couple of notes. It's, it's just nice. I just played a concert. So I really enjoy playing concerts for um, people who never go to a classical music concert and doing something a bit different. I made a version. I won't, I won't play it now, but like I did a version of Prokofiev's second violin concerto. Oh, can I hear? I mean, I mean like, you know... Uh, magical, isn't it? No, it's so beautiful and transportive. Like, yeah, and I played it for this audience, and they were like, "Prokofiev, that was amazing. We loved your Prokofiev. They didn't heard of Prokofiev, you know." So, yeah. Anyway, oh. I love. Yeah, Prokofiev. I actually had my son Zach to the symphony <laughs> the, from the competition. My had my son Zach. I was playing the Prokofiev uh, symphony while it, he was being born. Were you? I did. Wow, that's amazing. I love yeah. music, and I. They say that you know, That's music. Nice. It music helps you with math, with yes, English, and yeah. people don't realize how important it is. Yeah, that. I mean, like, just you've given me this opportunity to say, you know, I have here in the, in our audience today one of my board members, uh, Errol Rappaport, and um, you know, I'm so passionate about giving kids who want to have the opportunity to have music education. So I have this music foundation, which is really taking off this year. Uh, so to put it in perspective, over 12 years, we've worked with 7,000 kids. This year, we're working with 3,000 kids. So we're really expanding and just giving these kids an opportunity to uh, have music education, to perform with really world-class professional artists. You know, we've done concert Lincoln Center and amazing places. You were there, I think. I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was so for that. What do you think? 50, 60 kids on stage. Yeah, it was and amazing. And it sounded amazing. You know, we give them this opportunity where they're not, uh, anyway, I, I don't say not sounding good, they just are sounding, we, we just lift them, you know, to a whole other level. And they lift us with their excitement and just, we can feel how their lives are being totally transformed in that moment and it makes us all go, wah! You know, it's amazing, but yeah. So music education, I'm passionate about it. I'm passionate about it too because you and I grew up in a time where this was a given in school. I know. And now it's not. Yeah. I'm like, why are we trying to dumb down our population because that is a way to do it? Well, you know, get in touch with Daisy Joplin Foundation dot org uh, to support us. Um, yeah, yeah no, we, we, we have plans to go national and really, really change, you know, the opportunities for kids around the whole of the states. I mean, I do it internationally as well, but now we're probably talking to people in the U.S. I don't know. I don't know where your audience is, but anyway. I have to ask you this question. It's yeah. actually my favorite question to ask musicians. Mm. If you had to name a song yeah. or a cycle of songs, mm. who is Daisy Jopling? Wow. Oh my God. <laughs> the question you know, should change of, like of, all the time. Yeah, it should change all the time. 
I mean, you know, there is, it's, I don't know why this comes to my mind, but it comes to my mind. Like, there is that very, very famous song called Daisy Daisy. And, <laughs> Give me your answer, true. And, and this is, I don't know why I feel like saying it, but it's a very sweet song. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, love and, you know, kind of talking about the fact that a love is so pure and, and you know, you don't need to, it, it, it's not something that can be like, bought with money you know no not and, at all and I feel that I live my life that way I feel that I am this little bundle of joy and light and love you know um, so I feel like that song represents me actually it happens to be I love know, that I'm about or, to break into yeah, it <laughs> yeah. Give me I'm half crazy all for the love of you it won't will be, be a side marriage I can't cut before the carriage. But, but if you look sweet <laughs> upon the seat on a bicycle, bicycle built for, for two. two. <laughs> yeah. So I definitely live that, you know. And this is the time when we're when we're living in this really amazing time of opening and letting letting the abundance of life come into us all day yes. every day and realizing that, you know, it is about the abundance of every moment, being here today with these beautiful people and you know, yeah. You played at the pyramids. Yeah. How spiritual was that? And I want to say, you know, these were in Giza, because obviously there's a lot of pyramids around the world, but we are talking about the ones in Giza in Egypt. Um, I so wouldn't have even thought of anyone. <laughs> there's so many. I'm, so, I'm sure people knew that, but, you know. Um, so the way I, I love to stage a kind of entry in my concerts <laughs> you know i do feel like i love the the, the theatricalness i love the lighting I, I do the whole lighting design of all my concerts and like the projections and yeah they're spectacular you know, yeah it's, it's somehow i have a very artistic side and and anyway um so i had i staged this this that there is only one actual stage at the pyramids there's lots of quite big areas of gravel where they build stages all the time there's about 11 places of gravel, whatever, you know, around the pyramids where it is possible to perform. I There's didn't even just, know they no, did I that. I thought you didn't, yeah. And when I got there, I'm like, they say, where do you want to go? And, you know, we went around to all these places and it's just a bit of gravel. And the place is like so, Egypt is so beautiful and I love it to the moon and back or whatever. But around the pyramids, it's just really, really dirty and like, it's like kind of horrible. Um, really? Yeah, it's really weird. I mean, I think they're going to clean up it. But anyway, so there's all these bits of gravel. Like here, you can pay $50,000 if you want this, this bit of gravel, you know. <laughs> but we actually found an actual stage, which was a beautiful stage, which led to build the lighting rig and everything else. But in this particular stage, it was built that there was this kind of like high place where you could walk up behind. And then, so I decided to walk up and make my entrance at the top of the proceeding. I don't know, anyway, the back of this, the, the, it's called upstage, but the back of the stage. And um, I, I decided that the whole band, which was this amazing array, they were all Egyptian musicians, but some of them were more like from different aspects, you know, some of them were very traditional Egyptian instruments and some of them were like rock band kind of thing. Oh, nice. Um, and I mixed them all together and we, they were just, inc just amazing. Every single one was amazing. And I decided that they're going to play this intro and there's going to be an Arabic violinist playing a solo. You know, this is, this is amazing in Egypt that here I feel like we're so fast paced, but the Egyptian music generally, is slow and beautiful and it's real instruments all the songs I not all the music but most of the music which is most popular in the Middle East is real instruments rather than what we listen to here anyway all to say I had this intro which maybe lasted six minutes like a little long you know and I was waiting to go up these steps and make my entrance and I the pyramid was there and we lit it of course and it was actually it, I don't know if it was a full moon but it could have been it was one day maybe either side or the full moon and wow. I just I was ready to cry. I mean, I was in such awe because the pyramids, my feeling is, and the people who live around there from the research I've done, they believe that the pyramids were built with the help of, you know, another race or races that had, Aliens. Yeah, very kind of heightened, much higher than us knowledge, uh, you know, spiritually and also technology wise. And I believe that when you create something, you know, the energy that you use to create it is there. And those, those pyramids, when you look at them, it's not just the awe at how they, could they even have been built. It's the awe at the energy you feel. And it's extremely inspiring. And it makes you feel full of love. And like, you can't have a problem stand. I think that anyway. It's like life is just amazing standing next to the pyramids. And I just, I just, um, I can't even tell you. I felt like, um, of course, I'm the luckiest person in the world. But it was just, I'll never, ever, ever forget it. And the whole concept, when I listened back to the sound, I really believe the sound was magical that night. 
you know, it's a night, nobody in that whole, co they play concerts there, not regularly, it's not, it's not that often actually that people play concerts there, but um, it, it will be a night that none of us will ever forget. So wait, played that night set, or did you allow the music? There was a lot of improvising. Every single song piece was set, and a lot of it was, it was about 50% my music, and about 50% their music, so basically I played on their music, and they played on my oh, music, nice. which was so magical. Um, but in every solo, in every song, sorry, there were opportunities for solos. So everybody had their moment to shine. And they took time to solo. Like, you know, here it's like, ever, that's not true, some, some concerts go a long time, but they took their time. I was like, okay, let's do it, you know? We, we were just in that moment. It was, it was an amazing concert. I mean, amazing. But were you channeling some of the music? Which, or was it set? So there was, there was opportunities for improvisation within each song. Not, you know, all the set lists were set. But I have to say that, you know, I, I want to say that we as people can open ourselves to any level of energy anywhere in the world. I mean, that place inspires us to open us up immediately to these feeling like very joyful high levels of energy, you know, high vibrations. But we can do it anywhere. I mean, we channel and, you know, people channel around the world. I mean, you know. Yeah, but we don't talk about it. I do, but most yeah. people do not. Yeah. And I can't even imagine being in yeah. that kind of atmosphere. I know. I'm sure that there were portals that yeah, were open. I think so. so. I think so. And there was a very interesting, you know, when you feel like in life you have a breakthrough, yes. sometimes getting very near the breakthrough, there's tremendous challenge. There oh, was yeah. tremendous Tower challenge moments. leading up to the concert where we didn't know if it was going to happen on the day because some things had been very challenging. And it seemed like they, they, in this particular venue, even though it was a stage, they'd never had a concert there. They'd only had events where politicians or different people or, you know, companies were putting on an event. Suddenly a concert, and they'd never had a violinist be the solo artist in a concert. I mean, they had a violinist playing with right. singers, but like, so the whole thing, they didn't really know what was going to happen. They didn't really believe it. And they were like, they kind of, I don't know, it was interesting. I mean, I, my, I, don't, I wasn't dealing with it, my producer was, but she said it was the days leading up to the concert were beyond challenging. Oh, trust me, doing this podcast? Yeah. I, th I honestly think that I'm going to have a heart attack every single <laughs> week because what I think is going to happen, uh-uh. Yeah. Not at all. I yeah. just kind of have to go with the flow and yes. say, okay, it's going to be organic yes. and I'm going to be happy with whatever it yeah. is. And my publicist is always, oh, don't talk about this. But I'm like, why not? Yes. Why can't because I talk about life. this? And I, and I actually, you and I, when just before the podcast started, we started discussing something and you were like, oh, let's do that. Yes. In the actual interview. So, so we were talking about um, spirituality. Every, every show that I create, uh, there are many layers to it. And I need those layers. Like for some reason, I don't just want to play the music. The music itself has, you know, a deep meaning. But um, this next concert I'm doing, which is on Sunday, uh, this Sunday. Oh, let's talk about this. Yeah, so it's celebrating Irish music. So my father was in love with Ireland and I went there every year, every year of my uh. childhood. Uh, and so I, I formed this very, very, you know, deep love of Ireland, uh, of the people, of the culture, of the beauty, you know, of the actual country and countryside. And we always stayed by this amazing beach. Um, I'm going back there. I have a trip there, actually. 7th when? to 15th of September. If you want to come, you can sign up. Oh my God. To connect with me. And I'm doing a trip there and I'm doing a concert in my family home. Oh, and I'm really? Doing a trip through. It's, it's stunning. Anyway. Uh, Wait, I have to ask this. Yeah. How many albums do you have out? Actually, nine. Nine? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Are any of them of Celtic music? There are three Celtic songs on the second album that I did. I'm surprised you haven't hooked up with Lorena McKenna and done something. It is surprising, isn't it? I feel very, very connected with her somehow. Like, I mean, th there's a lot of similarities. Yeah, I saw I'm her sure concert. Have... I saw her concert this year. Yeah. Yeah. It and I love Celtic music. Yeah. Yeah, she's a big inspiration for me. I, like, I feel like we're, you know, there's some similarities in what we do. Yeah. But basically, this particular show, you know, because in, uh, of course, the ancient Druid, right. Celtic, you know, Merlin, uh, Merlin was apparently not one druid, but like a race of druids. Merlin, um, really? Yeah, I just heard that the day before yesterday or something. I was researching for my projections and for my lighting design and for the kind of metaphorical meanings behind my show, which nobody has to even know, but I just need to have them, you know? Right. And uh, it was this story about how, how we are going through these different phases in our life 
to you know it's, it's like we need to let go of so much we need to die to so much in order just phoenix to be. is time to be phoenix yes times to be phoenix and also die to you know we're all working on it a lot but like die to what anybody else thinks of us because it is totally irrelevant and understand that it's only what we think of ourselves that's the only thing it's just us taking responsibility to live up to ourselves you know if you know what i mean it's really interesting wait did did i ever tell you that i've died three times at least do you mean actual had near-death experience? Goodbye, yes. Yeah, and what I learned in like the second or third one yeah. was how much we are loved. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what we do on this world. It doesn't, nothing matters. We're just completely loved. And thank God that's the one thing that I've carried back with me. But yeah, absolutely. We're, we're here to break free a prison world. And I was never a good at prison percent. world either. <laughs> a thousand percent. Absolutely. A thousand percent. Yeah. Are you doing anything on April 8th? Um, I don't think so. Because there's supposed to be some portal and oh, eclipse and it's supposed to be this big deal. Oh, I haven't good. researched it yet and I haven't channeled it yet, okay. but I'm about to. Good. Good. Um, you're also doing a Dominican Republic trip. I am. Talk about that. Oh my God. So one of... Uh, you know, also things happen very organically. I could be having an interview with you and you're like, hey, Lorena McKenna, and I go home, I'm like, I gotta connect with, you know. Um, so in this way, somebody actually initially started off by telling me they would like to organize a concert for me in Jamaica. And Jamaica, okay, sometimes things are supposed to happen and they get challenging. Sometimes though, we understand that this is not supposed to happen. Oh, absolutely. And it got to the point where so many things weren't lining up that we uh, decided to, I mean, people had booked, but it wasn't lining up, and we decided to change to Dominican Republic. So, and that happened because one of my best friends who lives in Dominican Republic, who's been trying to get me to go there forever, told me she's actually a tour coordinator, and a tour operator. Oh, wow. So she is an incredible person. So I'm gonna go, be, we're five uh, fans are coming with me. Um, I'm playing a concert in a stunning villa overlooking the ocean. I mean, I mean, mega gorgeous, and it's incredible, like beyond beautiful where we're going. Um, and it's just a moment to, to connect deeply with nature, with these beautiful friends and fans of mine. Um, I think some more people are even signing up yesterday anyway, so let's see. Um, yeah, so that's going to be beautiful. And, and it's something, it happened, 16 fans came to Egypt, and it was a quite an amazing experience to share it with my fans in that close way. So. That's why I'm doing the island trip, and I'm sure every year. So next year we do plan the Taj Mahal. You know, we're just at that conception. I can totally see you doing that. But I have met this incredible Bollywood star, Kailash Kare, talking about. I mean, he's he's a mega mega star, and but he's the most spiritual. I mean, unbelievable human being and, and artist. I mean, out of this world, unbelievable. So we I plan to collaborate together and create something. Yeah, pretty amazing. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you would like our audiences to know about you? <laughs> um, I think I wanted to say that everything I do is all about um, the empowerment of us as creative human beings, you know, to really be whoever we want to be. I really believe that, I really believe that each one of us can reach that. Um, and this is what our, all our mentorship programs are about that through music, through the writing of songs, because we teach that, you know, through the creativity of improvisation, whatever, learning and playing an instrument. It's all about just loving who we are. We are so perfect, actually. Um, yeah. Thank you. This has been live from the Hotel Edison. Times Square Chronicles presents. I'd like to thank Craig Horsley, who is part producer of this show. Ramel Gopez, who runs the Hotel Edison and is really remarkable. I would like to thank you for being here. Our next week's guests are Maury Yeston and Victoria Clark from Nine and from uh, Nine Titanic uh, Grand Hotel, and Vicki Clark, who won the Tony Award for Kimberly Akimbo. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Daisy. My Daisy, pleasure. will you? Thank you so much for having me. Today. Oh my God. Will you please play us out with something St. Patrick's? I will. I'd love to. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you so much. Yeah.